Good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. Let's all stand as we begin our Sunday morning worship as we welcome the presence of God into his house today. Praise God, we are free today by the blood of Jesus Christ. Can we get an amen on that today? We're free because of what Jesus did at Calvary. Jesus paid it, he gave the price himself to sacrifice. He paid it all for us that we could be free today. Let's lift our hands and let him know we love him today. Thank him for what he has done for us. Jesus, we thank you because we are free today by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been set free. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all you have done. Let's give him a hand clap of praise. Let's worship him today in song. Shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave. Oh uh-huh. 
Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because he lives, we have hope. We have peace. We're alive today because he lives. Hallelujah. He is alive. He arose from the grave. Praise God. We have hope and we have peace today because of Jesus Christ. He gave his all for us on the cross, but he arose from the dead. Praise God. Our Savior lives today. All right, praise God. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And if you have a need today, our God is still alive. He's, yes. His ears are open. His eyes are open. And we're serving Him today in a mighty way. And we're going to take our prayer request. If you have a need with an uplifted hand, if you have a special need, we want to ask you to come forward and we'll lay hands on you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ gave it all at Calvary. He took upon Himself the stripes for our healing. This morning, all right, and uh, we're going to put all the names on the uh, prayer request on the board. We have so many things today to pray for, but we serve a mighty God that is able. Let's all go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Take all these needs. Yes, Lord, we come before you knowing that you're able to do above and beyond what we can ask or think. God, you have all power, Jesus. You're our provider. You're our healer. You're our deliverer. You're our soon-coming king. 
Yes, Lord, we know the trumpet's about to sound. But, God, we have needs this morning in this place. Lord, these that are coming forward, touch them with thy mighty power. God, let thy anointed healing power come down and heal them this morning. God, deliver them at the needs that they would have. Oh, yes, Lord, whatever the problem is, God, you would work it out according to thy will. God, thy will be done. Every unspoken need, God, it is brought before you this morning. God, you know what these needs are. We bring them before you, God, because you're able to do, and you know the intent and everything that's in the need today. In Jesus' name we pray it all. Amen.
adore. We want you, Lord, like never before. Help us sing that right now. Your presence, your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Say it again. Say your presence. Your Worship him this morning. God, we want to experience you like never before, Lord. We welcome your presence into this house this morning. God, as we worship you and we magnify you and lift your name on high, God, we're expecting a move of your spirit, expecting a move of your presence in this house this morning, Lord. God, we come with nothing less than great expectations, Lord, for what you're going to do in this place. God, we love you and we worship you this morning. Amen. Man, what a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Yes. Amen. So good to see all of you here this morning. So good to have all of our guests. Can we give our guests a good hand? Woo. Amen. We are so glad that you are with us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I am glad, glad to be back home. Glad to be back with each and every one of you. Amen. And uh, <laughs> thank you. was able to, to travel with uh, and spend some time with some of my family that I haven't got to spend much time with in, in, in some time. Uh, it's been years since uh, getting to get to go away for a week with my brother and my father and uncle and cousin, my brother-in-law. And so we had a great time uh, this past week in Alaska fishing and, and getting to, to see some amazing sights and do some amazing things. And uh, I'm so glad everything went well here. I'm glad that uh, God is still blessing, and you know what's the craziest thing? We, we, we traveled yesterday. I traveled, I traveled for, I say yesterday, I traveled for 28 hours straight from the time I left the camp to when I finally got home. So if a while preaching this morning, I say something that doesn't make sense, just you know that mercy we've been talking about in the book of James? There will be that day when you'll say something that's like, what is he even talking about? And I'll be like, you know what, I'm going to let this one slide. So, <laughs> But once again, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. I have several announcements this morning, so I'll go through this, and um, once again, any announcements, anything we got going on here, you can see them. We have them posted on the walls. You can open up your app, check out the bulletin, so if, you're, if it seems like a lot, you, can, you have all this information literally in your hand uh, that you can access at any time, but we hope you'll continue joining us on Tuesday evenings where we are praying for our country. Uh, we are praying for revival in our country. And uh, we're, I'm glad we're, we're seeing, and sometimes it seems like I see progress, and sometimes it seems like we're moving backwards, but uh, in the last week or so, it seems like things are uh, getting a little more under control, and we're going to continue to pray for our country. And so once again, on Tuesday evenings at 7.30 p.m., we invite you to join us right here in the sanctuary as we pray together. If you're not able to make it, we, we ask that you pray at home, but once again, there's something about coming together, amen? There's something about coming together and praying together, and so we hope to see you here. We also hope to see everyone this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, actually, is our Family Life Wednesday? Is this is it this Wednesday? Correct? Yeah. This Wednesday night is Family Life Wednesday. Uh, this will be the first one we've had in months, and uh, so we invite you to come out. We're having hamburgers, hot dogs, all the trimmings. So we're going, we're going, we're going to grill out or burn something, one or the other. But y'all come out, and we're going to have a good time. So that'll be at six o'clock. So we meet here. We'll, we'll start serving food from six to six forty-five in our Family Life Center. The cost is two dollars a person. That includes your your. That's a full meal, drink, everything, dessert. You come out. We'll have a good time of fellowship, eating together. And once again, that is in our Family Life Center um, this coming Wednesday. And then we'll have service here in the sanctuary beginning at 7 p.m. I will be continuing our Wisdom of James series. We have one more chapter to go. So we have just a couple more Wednesday nights, and we'll be closing this series out. And so I invite you to, to come and be a part of that as we'll have a great time. And, and I realize some of you may be a little skeptical of coming and eating, gathering, gathering. Um, at any point, you know, especially for any of our elderly, if, if there is any point you, you decide you want to wear a mask, I realize this week I found out yesterday as I got back there's been a little bit of an uptake in Knox County, um, which is just one county over from us. 
you know, feel, feel free to wear a mask. However, I'm not going to require it. I'm going to let you do what you decide you want to do and leave that to your discretion. But once again, uh, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable if you decide you want to wear a mask. You won't be judged one way or the other. And I ask that each of you would do the same. Is that all right? That, that mercy thing. We're going we're gonna <laughs> to extend it all ways. Um, lots of things going on this month. These next few announcements are things that are, that are uh, coming up here in the next month, month and a half. One is our, we're starting our Mother's Day Out program back up. That will be beginning the first week of August. And so they are having their open house on July 30th in our education wing from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. And we're excited about opening this back up. We have people registering weekly. Um, and if, you're, if you have any interest in placing your kids or grandkids in this program, uh, it, it is a, a phenomenal program we have going and uh, teaching our children not only the basics of life, but teaching them the Word of God. Amen. We want to train up our children knowing that they know the Word of God. And so this is for children ages 1 to 5 years old. This is a two-day-a-week. It will be on Wednesdays and Fridays from 9.30 to 2.30. And uh, we look forward to a great school year. If you have any questions or want any information on that, you can get with Sister Miller, and she can give you any details on that. This year, in light of everything going on, we are at the last couple of years, we've done a backpack giveaway Sunday. Um, and this has been something that we have enjoyed doing. However... With everything going on this year and even talking with some, some, some teachers and different stuff, we are not going to do the, the, the big push for trying to get as many people in here and, and pack it out and give away get backpacks and all of that. However, we are still planning to do a special service for our children as they prepare to go back into a school year, of which there's still a lot of uncertainty and we still don't know exactly what all is going to happen. And so we're going to have a special service for our children as they go back on Sunday, August the 2nd. We're going to have what we're calling a back-to-school bash Sunday we're going to be praying over our children. We're going to be giving them school supplies. And for any that would love to donate, there is a bin in the lobby. And we ask that, you know, for anybody that would love to, we, we, we would love for you to go and get school supplies and donate them so that we can distribute them to our children, to all the children of the church here. And uh, if, you, if you say, well, I don't have time to go out and buy it, you can also donate via our app, PayPal, or your tithe envelope. Just write school supplies on it. And all that money will go directly into purchasing school supplies, of which we will then distribute to our children on Sunday, August the 2nd. All right? Um, also, we are planning to go white water rafting on the Nantahala River. This will be on August the 15th. Uh, I realize it's a little bit out, but once again, this will be on August the 15th. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby. And we're asking that you sign up this week. If you could sign up by the end of ne by, by next Sunday, so July the 12th, you don't have to have your money in by then. But if you can at least sign up, because we got to call ahead and make reservations and give them a number. So the deadline to sign up is next Sunday, July the 12th. Um, we, we need a number to give them. The cost is $20 a person. So $20 a person, if you can give that, um, we'll get that and get, get them paid when we get out there. We will meet here in the, in the church parking lot at 6 a.m. that morning. So August the 15th, I know that's early. We'll meet here at 6 a.m., and we're going to drive straight out there. Uh, we'll drive down, we'll float the river, and drive back all in the same day. So it'll, it'll be a long day, but it'll be a fun day. We will have a blast for all those that went last year. Uh, we, we had a great time. Uh, we, we did more, more fighting than paddling, I think, trying to, trying to attack people and whatnot. But we, we have a good time with it, and we'll have a lot of fun. Um, for children, any children that are interested in going, the, their restrictions are they must be at least seven years old and weigh more than 60 pounds. So those are the, the two restrictions as far as you wonder how old my child have to be, at least seven years old, and they must weigh more than 60 pounds. Um, we, are, we are planning as of right now to start our choir back up at the end of this month. Um, and so there is a sign, if you're interested in, in, any, in any way, there is a sign-up sheet in our lobby. You can sign up, and Sister Brooke will be getting with you and getting you the details as to what will be going on uh, in the coming weeks. And lastly... If, as, our, as our ushers make their way, I'm about to ask for the musicians to come. They're already here. <laughs> but if you have any, if you have any, I know a lot of times people will text me or text someone if they have a prayer request and wanting to get on the board. If you have any prayer request, we ask that you would access your, your EBAC app. Go to, your, go to the app. On the homepage, there is a section right there on the homepage. When you pull it up, it says prayer request. You can click on that. You can type in your whole prayer request. And submit that, and if you do so, that would help us tremendously in making sure that we get it to the get it to the computer that it needs to go to to get all of that plugged in. Because sometimes somebody will text, send me a text, and I'm in the middle of something, and I'll be like, yeah, I'll get that. And then four days later, they're like, well, I, I didn't see it on the prayer. Well, 
I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> and so once again, but we have, we have something in place to keep that from happening, and I, I ask that you would help us with that. So once again, any prayer requests that we have, we want to make sure that we get those on the board. We want to make sure that we get them online so that way people can be praying and calling on those names. And you can help me tremendously with that, which is using the app and submitting those prayer requests. Amen? Amen. All right, we did it. We got all the way through all those announcements. I want to ask our ushers to come at this time. And if you would mind standing this morning, as we pray together over our tithes and offering, we're going to give you the opportunity to worship through giving this morning. Once again, if you don't have cash, please feel free to download our app, and, and you, can, you can give through our app, through our website, by clicking on the Give button. And uh, why don't you pray with me now? Lift your hand with me. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given back to me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither. I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved and walking with God, perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out. All that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. Amen. We invite you to march and give your tithes and offering this morning as the music plays under the direction of our ushers. You may come at this time.
children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children. May his presence, may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you in the morning, in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. 
How many know God is for you today? No matter what you came in here with, we serve a God that wants good things for his children, that wants to bless us, that wants to take care of us. But it requires us to give. It requires us to submit. It requires us to do our part, Lord. God, we love you today and we worship you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit, your presence, God. That is in this place, Lord. Lord, we love you today. How many? I'm so thankful for the freedom that we have to be able to come and to gather and to worship each and every one of us as we wish. That we, that we are able to worship God in whatever way we desire. Doesn't matter what people think, doesn't matter what people say. No one can take that liberty of, of praying and rejoicing to God from us. And I'm so thankful for the country that we live in. Amen. I'm so thankful for the United States of America. And I hope each of you were able to, to spend time with family yesterday as we celebrated our Independence Day as a nation. Yet we can have independence spiritually any day of the week. Whenever we decide to come and submit ourselves to him, to place it in God's hands. Because as long as we try to do it ourselves, we remain in bondage. As long as we try to carry this weight ourselves, the on, only thing we're doing is hurting ourselves because we keep ourselves in bondage. But when we depend on him, when we place it on him, he said, my, my yoke is easy. When we submit to God, there is a freedom because we, we accept truth. And the scripture says that the truth will make you free. Not set you free, make you free. It will make you free through the process of coming to truth. And I'm so thankful not only for our country, but I'm thankful for his word. I'm thankful that we have this truth of which we base and live our lives based on. Amen, amen. Once again, it's, it's so good to have every single one of you with us. You may be seated this morning. I thank our, our praise team and singers for doing a phenomenal job as always. And give them a hand. Let you stay seated as I begin this morning. I'm sure it's probably the same way with your families. Whenever you, you get together and you begin reminiscing and telling stories, and uh, probably every Christmas you tell the same stories, and every holidays when you get together, you start thinking about funny times and, and experiences and things that we've, that we've shared. And, and oftentimes those stories are sometimes ingrained in our minds or, or seared in our minds because of because of the emotions that we felt in that moment. What, whatever, whether joy or fear or, or anger, whatever that, that moment was, you know, sometimes it's, it's anger, but then we look back several years later and laugh, you know, at, what, at that experience or that time. Or maybe it was fear, but we look back, you know, looking, looking back, being on this side of it and looking back and just thinking. And so I was able to spend time, and like I said, with, some, with my family this week, and, and we made a lot of memories. However, while we were flying and driving we are sitting on the ferry we, we begin telling stories and different things and one of the one of the things that came back and what was about a trip it was actually a time when I went to Alaska before so I went my, my family when my grandfather retired my mom's father he he retired and decided to take the whole family on a cruise to Alaska and this I was probably 11 years old at the time and so we all we all went and and I, I, I remember it was, it was just an amazing, amazing trip. My brother would have been around eight years old at that time. And so we, we went and we, we did the whole cruise and, and vi visited Seattle. Um, and, and we got to go see the, the um, let me see if I say this right, salmon run. Sa salmon. <laughs> I, 
I was on the plane coming back, and I had an email from Sister Triplett. It said, very urgent, important video, must watch. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, what's going on here? Some, something's happened. And I pull it up, and it's how to pronounce Salmon. <laughs> and I, so I called her, and I said, well, we call it Salmon, and now I'm going down to the Wymart to, uh, <laughs> to buy some stuff. You know, it like, doesn't make any sense. So they, there's an L in there for a reason. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but I... <laughs> Sound, I think, yeah, and that's what's crazy. So we're up there with all these natives, you know, these people that live there, and they're like, "Y'all catch some salmon?" And I'm like, "They, they know how to say this, you know. They, they live, they live, breathing, and this is their livelihood, and they can say salmon right." But, uh, anyways, but we, you know, we did a lot of stuff, and, and uh, then on the flight home, we we flew from Seattle and uh, to Chicago, and I think back to Atlanta. Like once again, this is back when we when I was 11 years old. And so we, we all get back, and we're, we're doing getting all the luggage and everything. And it's, it's a group of us. I mean, there's, there's probably 15 or 20 of us as a group. And uh, we get all our luggage, and we're, we're going out, and we're almost to the vehicles. And, and uh, my mom starts looking around, and she says, where's Brent? And we start looking around because there's a group, big group of us. You know, we're getting back. It's dark outside. And we start looking around, and we realize that my, my, at this time my 8-year-old brother is missing. And we're in the Atlanta airport. And I don't know if you've ever been through Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, it's a city in and of itself. And that's no joke. If you go from the east side to the west side, it'll take you 25 minutes to get there um, driving. <laughs> it's, it's, a major, it's a major airport. And, uh, and we start looking around, and, and my brother is just gone. And so my dad goes into this, this flying panic. I mean, he just, you know, just, just takes off running, just running as fast as he can. And so, you know, we, we were... My dad began telling this story, and he, he ran. He, he, said, oh, he said he kept having to wipe the tears out of his eyes. He was in such a panic, you know, just, you know, what, what happened? You know, where, 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 is, where, is my, you know, where is my son? And, and he made, got all the way back to the baggage lane, and there sat Brent with a security officer on, on a bench. And uh, what had happened, like I said, it's funny now, but my brother, my brother he, he's always been the one that he was the tightwad. You know, he didn't spend a dime. So anytime we'd get around vending machines or pay phones, that jerk was going checking every one of them for any change that might be in there. And so while we were collecting our luggage and leaving, he saw this group of pay phones over there and was like, hey, might be a quarter in there. And so he goes over and starts checking all the pay phones, and he's just walking down the line. And the time he got done checking all the pay phones, he turned around and we were gone. And, uh, and luckily, a security officer watched him checking all the pay phones <laughs> for money and uh, went over and, he, you know, where's your parents? And he didn't know. And he said, well, son, you just, you just sit right here and they'll be right back. And uh, so Brent was just as calm as could be. He's just sitting there talking to a this security officer with a pocket full of change, you know, just living, living life, <laughs> you know, while my dad comes flying back in this panic, just thinking that somebody had taken him, that he was gone, you know, to get back. And there he sits there, you know, right, right where he left him. He was right there on the, right there on the, on a bench, the baggage claim. And, and though, you know, listening to my father tell that story, it's it, every detail as if it, as if, as if it happened yesterday, he can tell you the emotions. He can tell you every detail of every second of that experience because he went into this, this panic, this, this fear, you know, of, of what, what could have happened. You know, and, and like I said, it's been 20 years ago, but just when you listen to that story again, it, it's just like, man, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine going through that. And I want to share one more story with you this morning of someone leaving their child behind. If you will, turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, I'll begin reading in verse 41. You may stand if you'd like for the reading in honor of the reading of the word. Luke 2, 41. It says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast and when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. 
and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thus dealt with us? Why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. This morning, for, for, for a little bit, I want to talk, or I'll title my message with this. Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? If you could set your Bibles down, and let's pray one more time. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your spirit, for your anointing that's in this place. God, I pray right now that you would prepare our hearts for your word, Lord. God, as we're searching for you, Lord. God, we love you and we praise you, Jesus. God, I pray that your spirit would fall in this place. God, I feel your presence in this room right now. God, I feel your spirit in your hands upon me, Lord. God, I pray that you would anoint me, Lord. Help me to deliver the word the way that you would have me to deliver it, God. And we give you all the praise and the glory in the precious name of Jesus. Everyone said amen. 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 Before you're seated, look at your neighbor and say, where's Jesus? You know, this, this story should, should make my father feel better because even the hand-picked, parent, the hand-picked parents of Jesus left their child behind. And then not, not, for, not for a 15 or 20 minutes, for a day. They went a full day before they realized that they had left their son. I, I can't, and I can't imagine, I can't even begin to think of imagining what Mary and Joseph went through for three days. Three to not, not 15 or 20 minutes. They didn't just run back in. Oh, there he is sitting, sitting with the security officer. No, for three days, they searched. And, and I could, just thinking if it was my, my own child, there's no way I slept for three, those three days. Day or night, I'm searching. Day and night, I'm doing everything I can looking for my child. And so for three days, Mary and Joseph frantically searched for Jesus with no avail. And then after this, this three-day search, They finally find Jesus just sitting in the temple. They had been at the temple. They had been there doing their stuff. And he was right right back there where where he left them. There there he sat. That's why Jesus asked him, where'd you think I'd be? I'm right here. I'm right here where you left me. I'm I'm right back here about my, my father's business. He asked, you know, Jesus did what he did best when they came and they said, why did you do this to us? Why have you dealt with us? You know, we... Did you, did you not realize the sorrow, the anger, the pain, the, you know, everything that we went through? Why did you do this to us, Jesus? And Jesus did what he does best, and he answered with a question. <laughs> How is it that you sought me? <laughs> w- wish you not know that I'd be right here? D- d- did you not know that, that you would find me right, right where you left me? You know, Jesus, like, I, I, you know, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? Where, where did you think I would be but in my temple, but in this house? about my father's business. You know, Jesus was confused as to why they even had to search for him. He said, you should have known where I would be. You know, they they left, but Jesus knew they'd be back. Eventually, they'd come back looking for him because when they realized they had left him behind, you know, because they see they were too concerned with everyone else. They're walking for for a full day. they, They weren't, they were, they were just as they were fine with just talking with the people around them, going with the flow, assuming that Jesus was with them. Worse as they were supposing that he was somewhere in the group they were traveling with. They traveled a full day assuming that Jesus was right there with them, traveling with them before they realized he wasn't there. You know, my, my brother Brent, he didn't run off. He didn't leave the group. The group left him. He was sitting right, right there where we all were. We just didn't make sure that he, was, that he was still with us before the group left. And we, we traveled and we went and we assumed that he would be with us. Yet we were, he was able to be found because he was right where we left him. The definition of assume is supposed, uh, supposed to be the case without proof. Anyone here ever made a wrong assumption? Why, why is that? Because we didn't have any proof. We assumed, we, we supposed this thing to be a fact, yet we had no proof to back it. That, that's, that's an assumption. 
you know, and, and so we, we've been going through the book of James on Wednesday nights. And I, the reason I love James because James is a man of proof. He's not one to make assumptions. He says, you come and you tell me you have faith, but where's your proof? You say you have wisdom, but where is your proof? He said, you tell me you, you, tell me you have this, and that's all well. He said, but I'll show you, I'll prove you my faith through my works. I'll prove you the wisdom that I have by, by my works. Because there has to be proof to back what you say. That James, James was not a man of, of assuming anything. Yet we live in a world where the media doesn't care about the truth anymore. All you hear a lot of times is either lies or assumptions. Or the combination of the two. Because truth doesn't sell. People aren't interested in the truth anymore. We'd rather hear a good assumption. You know, this, this wrong or malicious assumption is, is now the norm in our culture. Assumptions are something that, that we should always avoid, especially when it comes to our walk with God. There should be no assumptions in our walk with God. I don't want to get to heaven one day and stand before God and just say, well, I, I assumed I'd make it in here, Lord. I assumed that when I got here that everything was going to be all right. I assumed that because you blessed me that, that everything would work out when I, when I stood before you. Those are assumptions that we, we can't afford to make. We cannot afford to make these assumptions. You know, we can't go through life just assuming that we're all good with Jesus. That if we went today, you know, it would be, it, we'd be in heaven. That's easy to assume. Easy to assume that, that Jesus will make an exception f for me. Because we've always been taught there's an exception to the rule. We'll, we'll go through life assuming that Jesus is walking right beside us as we pursue things that may take us away from his will. And we think, well, God's omnipresent. He's always there. He has to be there with me. Yet when we don't pray or have communion with God, but we need an answer we expect God to give us that answer in about a day. And if he doesn't, then we just think, well, that must be God's will because he didn't, he didn't tell me no. He didn't open up, part the clouds and come down with an answer that said, no, you shouldn't do that. Here's your, here's your stop sign. But no, we make assumptions. We assume that God must be okay with this. We assume that God is with us. And we walk through life so caught up with everyone else around us. So caught up with going with the flow, so caught up with the crowd, caught up with our family and acquaintances and all these different things, that one day we eventually come to a place where we look around when we need Jesus the most and say, well, where's Jesus? You know, we start looking around and say, I, I, thought, I thought he was with me. I, I thought we were on the same path together. I thought we were walking this together. Yet when we look back, we, we see that somewhere along the way we diverged off the, ro off the road of which he had laid out for us. And it's not that he walked away from us. Because if we start backtracking, we find him right where we left him. Because Jesus doesn't leave us. If you find yourself walking and we turn around and we say, where's Jesus? It's not because God walked away from you. It's because we walked away from him. I thought he was with me. I thought Jesus was following me. And that is our problem. Because we think sometimes in our carnal mind, and maybe this is just me, but sometimes there, there's been times and phases and seasons in my life where I just assumed that Jesus was following me. But if he's following me, then that means he's behind me. Therefore, my eyes cannot be on him. Because we are to follow him. You don't, Jesus, you won't get away from Jesus as long as you keep your eyes on him. As long as you're following him. As long as you're right behind him and your eyes are on him and you're walking step by step by step following, following Jesus, you don't have to worry about him getting out of sight or getting out of reach or getting off the wrong path. But it's when we start assuming that he's just somewhere around us, somewhere in the group. And as long as, once again, as long as, but as long as we're following him, as long as our eyes are fixed on him, as long as he is the main pursuit of our life, Hopefully, we never have to ask that question of where's Jesus. However, I would venture to say that for many of us here, myself included, that there's been a time in our life of which we've probably done that. Where we've gotten to a place and looked around and realized, I've wandered, I've wandered off the, the path. I, I've, at some point, I, I, I've walked away and I left, I left Jesus standing back there on the road of which he had, he had, pla he had placed for me. That he had mapped out for me. 
that moment where we look around, that moment of time, realize that somewhere along the way, we left Jesus because he doesn't leave us. Not, not that we stop coming to church, not that, not that we backslid, but just somewhere along the way, like the song says, it's a slow fade. You know, we start, we're still walking, and, and as long, we're still thinking, well, as long as I can see them, I can kind of wander over here as long as I keep an eye on them over there. And we get with this group of people, and we, well, you know, these people, they love Jesus too, and we start assuming that, well, as long as I'm fellowshipping with, with good people, then, then obviously he must be close enough that I can, can reach him. And we have this, we start this assumption until the time comes that we need him the most, and we start looking around wondering where he is. There are four stages of which we go through when we reach that threshold. When we reach the threshold of where that point in time where we look around and we ask ourselves, where's Jesus? Where, 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 where is he? I, I thought, I assumed he was following me. The first stage is panic. When Mary and, Ju- Mary and Joseph were walking along and they started looking for Jesus, their first stage was, was, was panic. Where is he? I thought, I, thought, I thought you knew where he was. I'm sure there was some, bl- there was some blaming going on there where Mary was blaming Joseph and Joseph was blaming Mary. You know, when, when my dad realized that Brent was no longer with us, there, there was, you know, I'm sure that there were thoughts going on across saying, well, th- that person should have seen him. That person should have made sure. And all of a sudden, this, this, this full-on panic of, of not thinking clearly, of, of this illogical unreasoning of what do I do? Where, where is he? What, where, why, why, why doesn't this, where, where is, what's going on? The definition of, of panic is a sudden overpowering fright or extreme anxiety. You know, we have this moment of this sudden terror because we realize that somehow we lost God along the way. Somehow we lost God and we, we can't figure out exactly what happened or, or, or where it may have taken place. Because some, you know, and, and, it's crazy to think that we could lose the God of which we claim to love so much, the God of which we love and we serve. Yet there can be times and seasons in our life where something de- derails us or deters us and we start to wander and we start to walk away from God. You know, sometimes we take that person for granted that we love the most in this world. Can I get an amen there? And, and sometimes we can take for granted that person that we love most in this world because they're so dependable, reliable, and faithful in our life. We don't worry about them wandering off because we know they're, they're faithful. Oftentimes that's our spouse or, 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 or maybe a sibling or father. You know, and, and we take them for granted, not out of spite, but we just get used to that person always being there, always being dependable. They're, they're always going to be there. And we just assume that they'll always be there for our beckoning call to step in when we need them, to bail them out when we need us to. And sometimes we do that same thing for it with Jesus. We take Jesus for granted because of how faithful he is to us. Because we serve a faithful God. We serve a God of which, like the video, the prayer said, you know, we put our dependence on him. We depend on God because he is faithful to his children. And then when we have this moment when we realize that we're no longer walking step, stride, and stride with Jesus. But somehow, while going with the crowd, we didn't even realize that we left Jesus behind. And this fear sets in, and this moment of panic, knowing that any, any moment, this, our last, our, this breath that we're taking could be our last breath. And to think that, that we may not be ready to meet Jesus because we left him somewhere behind. You know, once again, I, I, knowing, knowing that if we're not right with God, that when we stand before him, we may or may not hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You see, my Bible says there's only two places, heaven or hell. Either we meet the qualifications and we stand before a, a, a merciful and gracious God who looks at us and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or we will find ourselves in a devil's hell. There's no in between. You see, heaven has walls and gates to control who comes in and goes out. The scripture says that hell is enlarging, it, enlarge, is enlarging itself and it's, it opens its mouth without measure. When we come to the place where we realize 
that there may be a better chance of us making hell than heaven, then panic should be our response. Panic should be what sets in our lives. That fear that grips us at our core should be our response, that extreme anxiety. When we realize that, that we're no longer walking with Jesus, panic should set in. Why? Because being in panic has a searing effect on our mind. When you enter that emotional panic, there's something that, that sears in your mind that you don't soon forget that moment, that moment of what it's like to be without Jesus. It's that moment you will never forget. And so we enter that first age of panic. But if, and if you find yourself there, know that it's but just the first stage. And hopefully we don't have to stay in that stage very long. The second stage is searching. You know, once Mary and Joseph realized and the panic set in, they realized that he wasn't there. The next stage was, okay, we got to calm down and we have to search. We have to look for him. We have to search day and night until we find Jesus. Because we can't, we can, we're not moving forward without him. They, they were moving this way. And they said, wait a second, we got to go back and we got to get Jesus. Make sure he's with us before we start moving forward again. If you've been walking and you realize Jesus isn't there, maybe it's a time to stop or stop right where you are in your life and go back and say, I got to go back and for, the, and for the next season of my life, I have to find Jesus. I have to search until I find him. Day and night, no matter what's going on, no ma yes, everybody, the rest of their people kept going. The rest of their family kept going. The rest of their caravan kept right on. But Mary and Joseph said, we have to go back until we find Jesus. Don't let people, don't let people deter you or keep you from searching for God in your life. Don't let going with the flow keep you from going back and saying, I have to find Jesus before I can take another step forward. Because every step you take forward without Jesus is just one more step you're going to have to go back if you ever want to find him again in your life. Don't get discouraged because for three days, they didn't find him in a day. They didn't find him in two days. They searched for three days, day and night before they found Jesus. Don't get discouraged that the first time you come to an altar, you might not find Jesus in the, or find the answer that you were looking for. Is that all right? You pray a prayer and God doesn't answer it the first day, you keep coming back and keep searching. You keep coming back and search for day two, and you search for day three because they kept searching for Jesus with such desperation. You see, this, this stage of searching is not for the weak, but it's for the desperate. It's for those that are desperate that say, I will not go home without Jesus with me. I will, I cannot go back to where I came from unless Jesus is with me. And so this stage of searching, you have to get to a place where you are desperate enough that it doesn't matter what anybody says. doesn't matter what everybody else does. doesn't matter where everybody else is going. You have to find Jesus before anything else can move forward in your life. You keep searching until you have that proof that you need, that Jesus is with you. Search until you find Jesus once again. The third stage is recovery. That moment in which you recover that which was lost. I remember that my father, you know, he, he just talked about the overwhelming, you know, joy that came, you know, that, that, that relief that he found when he got back and he's searching everywhere and he looks and there sits his son right there on a bench that, that, that moment of relief and as he recovered that which was lost. Because now, now, now that, that, that it's a time of exceeding joy where we no longer have to ask the question of where's Jesus because we're looking at him. We've embraced him. We have found him. We have found that answer of which we're looking for because we're standing with him and our eyes are on him. Our proof once again stands before us that he is with us, that we are with him. Some may consider, consider this the best stage of the four stages but the last stage is probably the most important. The last stage is the stage of prevention. You see, we've walked through life assuming everything was good. Then we had our moment of panic, of which will ever, forever be seared in our minds. We search until we recover Jesus, and we're now reunited again. But if we take no preventative measures... These four stages will become a cycle of which we continue to find ourselves in. If all we do is find Jesus and embrace him and say he's with us, now let's go right back to where we was headed and we get our eyes off of him again. This just becomes a vicious cycle that we repeat and repeat and repeat. You see, the next time we went through an airport, my dad had a different mindset because of what happened last time. We, we didn't wander away from the baggage claim until he was holding our hands. 
he, there were preventative measures in place to say, hey, I'm not going to lose you again. We're not about to go through this thing again and, and me have to go through and experience everything that I had to go through. That is not something that I want to repeat. And we should do the same things in our lives. How so? In training and teaching our children. You see, one of the best ways to learn is through others' experience. If that, that, it may not be the most effective, but it's the best way to learn. If you can learn through someone else's experiences, then you can avoid a lot of pain and heartache in this life. If you're willing to listen and you're willing to apply. You know, sometimes as, 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 a, as a younger man, I used to think, I, I, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I got this figured out. The older I get, the more I'm like, please give me all, every experience and wisdom, just pour it on me. I'll, I'll listen to whatever you give me. You know, I, I've, I've tried that. It ain't no fun. <laughs> I would rather learn from, from your experience. I would rather learn and listen to the wisdom of those that have gone before me. You see, and let us learn from our mistakes. Let us learn from our assumptions. And let us put preventative measures in place for our lives. But let us make sure that we do the same thing, not only for our lives, but for the lives of our children. If we see the things that we've stumbled and the mistakes that we've made, it, it, I don't believe in a generational curse, but I do believe that Satan will use the same thing on your children that you struggle with. And so if you can overcome those and put preventative measures in place for your life, why are we not doing the same for our children? To make sure that they don't have to battle those same giants. We need to be praying for their protection every day. We need to be creating guards and boundaries of which ensure their safety physically and spiritually. And in setting measures in place, we will, we will, we will make sure that, they never have, that we never have to go through those four stages again. Of which we look around and find ourselves in panic because we've wandered away from Jesus. See, those moments like this, they, they change us. And they bring about changes in our lives. If every time, you know, uh, of, if ever there was a time of, of things changing rapidly, it's right now. You look around and, and things are happening that you would, that last year I'd have said, you'll never, that'll never happen. You'll never see this. And now every week, it's more and more things that are changing so rapidly. And, our, and, and with, with our culture and our world changing so rapidly, our children needs to be, need to be taught of, of all the things that it takes to make it through this thing called life. You see, while maintaining a personal, make, make, having that personal walk with God, you may have that down pat, but you need to make sure your children have that. You see, my, my children won't make it through life on my, on, on my spiritual walk. They have to have their own, and I have to teach them. It is my responsibility, I, I, not only as the father, but as the spiritual leader of my house, it is my responsibility to teach my children, to make sure that they know how, how, how to how to pray, how to get in touch with God, how to make sure that their eyes are on him, to make sure that everywhere they go, that they can still see Jesus. Our scripture at the beginning of this year, uh, Matthew 5 and 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. I said once again from the, from the beginning, I've been saying if we can get that pure heart, it's not that we're going to see God on the last day, but that we can see God in every day. Because if we can see God every day in our lives, then we don't have to ever look around and say, where's Jesus? But we have to have that pure heart. We have to be teaching. Because if, if, we, don't, if we don't teach our children, guess what? There's a whole world out there that will teach them for free. There is a world out there that would love, that would love to teach your children. Why are there people riding in the streets and burning down stuff? It's because parents didn't teach their children. But somebody out there did. See, we celebrate liberty and freedom today. Yesterday, this whole weekend is, is a weekend in which we celebrate the liberty and the freedom that we have as Americans this weekend. While at the same time, some are trying to destroy and erase not only our history, but the morals and values of which this country was built upon. One nation under God. Though for many, Jesus is hard to find because he's been pushed out of schools, our government, out of the public arena, and even out of homes. And there is an indoctrination taking place in our world where our world wants to immerse and indoctrinate our children with their culture. And if you may disagree, but we've seen it all throughout history. Daniel chapter 1, as the musicians make their way. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. 
said, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasures of the house of his God. And, they, and he, the king spake unto, unto Ashpenaz, and the, ma- the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge, and understanding and science and that, and such as had the ability to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. When the king took the children of Israel, he said, I want you to go find the best of the best of the children of Israel. And I want you to bring them in here, and I want you to immerse them in the learning and the way we speak. I want want them to know what we believe. I want them to know how we operate. I want them to know and to participate in our culture. You see, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were to be immersed in this culture and learning of the Chaldeans. This was their attempt at a cancel culture. They wanted to cancel out the culture of which they had grown up in. They, they, they wanted to brainwash these men and make them believe what they wanted them to believe. Yet these men had been taught from a very young age, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and him alone shalt thou serve. No amount of indoctrination could change the preventative measures that had been placed in their lives by their parents and teachers. For years they tried to change these men and immerse them in all their culture, but nothing could change their, what was at their core because of the preventative measures that had been, in, had been in drilled into them and placed in them. This is why teaching our children is so important. This is why, we don't, why, why is our, the, the younger generation of our nation trying to tear our nation apart? Because someone was willing to invest in them. It just wasn't the person or the people that needed to be. Teachers and college professors hold great influence, especially when parents don't teach or have preventative measures in place. This is why in January of this year, we, we started our Mother's Day Out program, child care program in which we are, we are teaching children and children in our, in our community about Jesus so that they can grow up in a world that, that will try to change them. But we hope to place something in them of which they never turn loose of, a love for God in which they never release. That says no matter what you try to tell me, no matter what you try to say, there is something about Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There is only one God in this world, and his name is Jesus. See, this Mother's Day Out program is something that requires sacrifice. But what better investment can we make than ensuring the gospel in the next generation? If you want something to support, I encourage you to get on board. That's something great to support. This is why next school year, one year from now, we hope to open a Christian school for our children. I'm not, as, I'm not as concerned about how many we have or numbers in it, but I, I, I am all about creating a culture of Christian learning for our children where they not only learn the basics of, of, of education, but they learn how to have a walk with God. They learn, they learn the Word of God. They know how to dissect the Word of God for themselves through the, with their own lives. They can read it with their own eyes and, and be able to pull and allow God to speak to them. I want to make sure that our children are as prepared as they can be as they enter this world of which we live in today. Because our world has no problem teaching our children if we fail to do so. The greatest teacher is modeling. You go to any any kind of education degree, that, that is the number one thing they will teach you. Is that the greatest teacher is modeling. Our kids will do what they see us do. If you tell your children to do this, but you do the opposite, what are they going to do? They're going to do what you do. What do our children see us doing? What gods do our children see us worshiping? How do our children see us treating others? What priorities do we set in our lives? Because the priorities that we have are the priorities that your children will have. What things do we put before God and put before church? Because they learn how to live their lives by watching what we do.
So this morning, as we consider, if, if, if we consider all of this and the great responsibility that we have, not only as Americans and not only as the church, but also in, in parents, as parents, to make sure of our walk with Jesus today and to ensure the walk for our children. We need to make sure that we don't have to keep continuing to come to the place where we look around and wonder, where's Jesus? Where did I leave him? This morning as you stand, This morning, I, here lately, I, I've, 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 not, I've just been opening altars and letting people know if you're comfortable to come. But this morning, I invite you to go, to find a place at an altar to pray, to talk to God. Because maybe today could be that searing moment in your mind in which you wake up and realize, you know what? I've wandered away from God. If I'm looking, if I'm being honest, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be honest. This this. This whole thing requires truth and honesty of looking down inside of you and saying, am I truly walking with God or have I left him behind somewhere along the way of life? Have I got so busy in other pursuits? Have I got so concerned with other people that as I was walking, I look around and now I don't quite know where Jesus is. Why not get back on track today? Why not start searching today as if our lives depend on it? Because they do. And not only our lives, but the lives of our children and our grandchildren depend on what we do today and how we model our walk with God. And so I invite you to pray this morning. Let's pray and let's touch heaven. that encourages me this morning is that when my dad lost my brother and Mary Joseph lost Jesus they were right where they left them they didn't have to, they didn't have to look too far Jesus where did you expect to find me I'm in my temple 
Today our world is looking for Jesus in all the wrong places. They're looking to fill that, that God-sized void in their life in all the wrong places. Jesus said, you should look in the temple. Where did you expect to find me? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Matthew 5, 13, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Our world is searching for the light. Our world is searching for answers, searching for something that they can't seem to find out there. Where, where can our world find Jesus? They need to find it in you. When our world is searching for Jesus, they need to find it in you. We are the temple. We are the body of Christ. Ye are the light of the world. So let your sight, your light so shine as we bring glory to our Heavenly Father. We have a, in a world filled with darkness, never has there been greater opportunity because the darker the darkness, the brighter the light shines. I look at everything we have going on around us with great opportunity to shine the light of Christ to our world. Ye are the light of the world. It is us that must carry this light into all the darkness, sh shedding that light abroad, not for our glory, but for his this morning. I ask Pastor Trippa to come and dismiss us in prayer this morning. Jesus is very near right now. Let's reach out and touch him as we close. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we know that you are here. Where's Jesus? He's right here in this place right now. We lift up our hands to touch you. Lord, we lift up our voice and ask you to come near to us. Lord, we reach out to you and ask you to go with our families. Lord, we, we reach out and touch you, Lord, to draw you closer to us. Lord, be close to us, to our children and our children's children, God. Be near to us. Walk with us every step of the way. Lord, bless us and keep us. Make your face to shine upon us as we leave this place. Walk with us, Jesus. We worship you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you and thank you for being here today. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.